All righty. Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation. I'm Em. I'm one of the librarians here at Rockland Public Library. We are so, so, so thrilled to be hosting tonight's event with the Historical Society. Um, first, before we get started, a couple quick housekeeping notes for those of us joining on Zoom, which I think is that camera right there. Please make sure to keep your camera and microphone off for the duration of the event. And then if you have any questions, you're welcome to type them as you think of them into the chat. Um, and I will read them aloud during the Q&A portion at the end. And then for those of us joining in, Zoom, uh, in person, also welcome. And I have this handheld microphone here. So when we get to the Q&A portion, please raise your hand and I will run this over to you so that the Zoom folks can hear your question as well. Uh, next couple events coming up at the library this Monday, the 21st at 2 p.m. We're going to be hosting a reading and author talk with main author Kevin St. Jair on Paris, California, his latest book. And our book group catching up with the classics is going to be meeting directly after the talk. So if you're interested in uh, experiencing that, you're welcome to join that as well. That's at 2 p.m. on Monday. On Thursday, the 24th at 6 p.m., we're going to be hosting our lawn concert, the last one of the season for us with Louisa Stancioff and the Kelly Brothers. They are an indie folk group inspired by Louisa's Bulgarian heritage. And the rain date for that, in case we need that, is September 5th. The following Wednesday at 2.30 p.m., we're going to be hosting a library tour led by our librarians, Jesse and Patty. Uh, it's going to be focusing on the history, art, and architecture of the library with a special focus on some of the past head librarians here at the library. If you haven't seen the silhouettes that they have, of, like hand-drawn silhouettes of some of the past librarians, they are so cool, and they're going to be having some of those out for people to look at, too. So that's at 2.30 on Wednesday the 30th. That's the library tour. And I think that that's it for me, so I'm going to welcome Brian Harden of the Historical Society to come introduce tonight's speaker, and thanks again to everyone for joining. Thank you, M. I'm going to do a little advertising before I introduce our speaker. Um, the Rockland Historical Society is, uh, this year we're going to have our 45th annual meeting. We're actually almost 46 years old. We formed in 1977. Um, as a result of a project looking forward from our bicentennial. And Mr. Malloy, who's in the third row, was actually on the council when we celebrated the bicentennial 46 years ago. <laughs> and it doesn't seem possible, but <laughs> here we are still. So for our 45th year, we have created a baseball cap. Um, it is embroidered with the eagle, which is upstairs next to the round part of the old part of the library building. It is the eagle that was on the Custom House on Main Street in the late 1860s. So if these hats are here and available, and if you speak to our curator, who's not in the third row, oh, there you are, um, <laughs> Ann Morris, who's further back than she usually is, um, she can get you one of these hats. Um, and the other thing is we are experimenting with shirts. I have a sample of these, but we have not produced them. So if you have an interest in this, please also mention it to Anne afterwards because we have not ordered. We, we only got a few. And if there is interest, we will order more. Thank you. Tonight's program um, is one of our own. Um, Leith McDonald, who's our presenter, is a member of the board of directors of the Historical Society. And the society sort of partnered with the Farnsworth to help Leith create this exhibit by finding photographs, uh, working with um, what painting was painted where and when and um, 
I, I worked with Lee for over a year, and I really enjoyed it. He was a delight to work with. And at the same time, Ann Morris has created a walking map that shows where Edward Hopper painted when he was here in the summer of 1926, so that you can take the map and go out around town and find the places where Edward Hopper painted. Um, Andrew Wyeth painted in more places in Rockland. The catalog that goes with the exhibit, Hopper and Wyeth, has an indication of where some of those places are. So without any more from me, I'm going to let Luke give you a little of his background and then his program on painting in Lime City. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian. <clears throat> so yes, I am Leif MacDonald. I am on the board of directors here at the Rockland Historical Society. I am um, the president of the board of the Monhegan Artist Residence um, Program. I work for the Brandywine Art Museum. Um, in, a, in a funny turn of events, I have worked at the Farnsworth for years. In fact, when I moved off Monhegan in 2009, I moved to Rockland and I began working at the Farnsworth and I stayed there for about five years. And then I began working at the Wyeth Study Center in 2015. And recently, Betsy's estate has settled out and part of the way it's settled is I now work for the Brandywine. So this exhibition has been an interesting uh, partnership really between the Farnsworth and the Brandywine working together to bring these uh, Edward Hopper and Andrew Wyeth paintings of Rockland together here in the city of Rockland. And um, I'm just going to jump right into it. So this exhibition is only up for a little bit longer. It comes down August 27th. Um, it spans across two galleries, and it was my great pleasure to put together, uh, give you an idea of the genesis of this show. Really, um, back in 2004, Suzette McAvoy was a curator at the Farnsworth Art Museum, and she put together an exhibition called Edward Hopper's Rockland, which explored the works that he had done here, and for the first time pulled them back together and showed them here. And she got almost all of them in one exhibition. It's incredible. I never got to see that show, but I've read about it plenty since. And then in 2018, I had an opportunity to explore Andrew Wyeth's time here in Rockland. Uh, I was working with a database, it wasn't super friendly, but I learned how to crack the code and search for Rockland, and it changed from finding one painting that was titled Rockland to over 60 pieces that mentioned Rockland in the notes. And for the first time, we were able to explore the city of Rockland as a serious body of work within Andrew Wyeth's career. And one of the things that we learned is that Andrew painted here repeatedly between 1939 and the early 2000s. Um, unlike Hopper, who had only one trip to Rockland, he was here in 1926 only. Um, we did um, come up with a catalog for the exhibition. Um, it was great fun to work with. It comes with the map Brian mentioned, some essays, an essay where our, I argue that Really, it was the work that was done here in Rockland that inspired these uh, artists to greater heights. And uh, all the work from the exhibition is reproduced in the catalog. Let's see what else we've got. Oh, and it's full of these photos from the Rockland Historical Society, which really um, is the thrust of what we're here to talk about today. Um, but really, this, this show specifically, uh, I'll jump ahead to this one. So this is an Andrew Wyeth painting um, of Rockland. And this was in the show that I put together in 2018. You, as you can see, it's kind of looking up at the backside of Main Street. And having already worked at the Farnsworth, I was aware of this painting that Hopper painted 35 years earlier and knew how similar they were. You know, I had a postcard of the one I could hold up next to the Wyeth painting, but uh, in many ways, this current exhibition that's up now is just a manifestation of the desire to show these together side by side on the wall. And that got me thinking, what other interesting pairings are there? What else can we put together here in the show? And I would encourage you to go and see it. If you live in Rockland, the Farnsworth is always free to you. Just come on in whenever you like. Um, 
But I'm not here to talk about the paintings. I'm here to talk about these, these photographs. Um, you know, there's this challenge to explain the city of Rockland. You know, it's, it's a very different place in 1926 than it is today. Uh, you know, instead of having 40 galleries, there were more like 40 grocery stores, if you can believe that. Um, and so how to, you know, explain that to everyone without hitting them with like, a, here's a, you know, 5,000 word essay <laughs> prior to looking at all these paintings. We used photographs to tell, you know, the story. They say photographs, you know, can tell a thousand words. I feel like this one tells about 2,000. And I'm going to tell you some of them, what I see in this one right here. When Hopper came to Rockland, he actually came by accident. Uh, he was busy getting famous. He wasn't famous at all in 1920. Well, he was just getting famous in 1926. But his seminal painting, Nighthawks at the Diner, which we all think of, you know, hadn't been created yet. In fact, Hopper had a hard, difficult time launching his career. Between 1913 and 1923, he didn't sell a single painting. He was a miserable commercial illustrator by all accounts. But the light of his life, his love, Josephine, was a successful artist. And she had been uh, exhibiting in the Brooklyn Museum. And she was able to harangue a curator to look twice at her husband's work and got him uh, up in the Brooklyn Museum, which led to a sellout show of his watercolors of Rockport, Massachusetts, the following summer. In 1925, Hopper didn't have a lot of new work to exhibit, so he had to fall back on some things that he'd made in Paris at, just after the turn of the century, some etchings he'd made on Monhegan in the teens. But these were not things you could sell for big money. These were drawings and prints. These are not bringing in what the gallery wants. So in the summer of 1926, Hopper was told, I'm sure in no uncertain terms, to get his butt up to Maine and come back with something to sell. Um, you know, looking at all the paintings that he created that summer, they're all the same size. They're all painted with the same colors, the same palettes. I'm sure he just loaded up with his art materials in New York, got on the train, and came up. And the first place that he came to actually was Ellsworth. Uh, he wrote to his dealer he did not like Ellsworth. For whatever reason, it didn't reside didn't uh, resonate with him at all. So in three days, they took the train back up to Bangor and then came down the Penobscot on a steamship. And they arrived in Rockland, I would say right here on the Eastern Steamship Terminal. Uh, you know, maybe even on one of those two boats. You know, stepped off the boat, walked down this road here and was immediately you know, confronted with this bustling city. There's the fish packing plants on our left, what would have been his right stepping off. And then all of these ships that were tied up on the right hand side, which he would paint repeatedly over his time in Rockland. Um, there's the rail system. Uh, if you're familiar with Hopper's work, you know that he loved trains and railroads. Uh, so Hop Hopper really fell in love with Rockland, I think, in, in many ways. It resonated with him. Uh, here's a look at one of those beam trawlers. This is um, the Widgeon you see on the left. And this painting on the right, I mean, this is him really just walking up that boat, looking across the wooden gangplank at those boats right there. It's one of the first things he saw when he got off the boat. Uh, this painting's in the collection of the Princeton Art Museum, uh, Princeton University. It's not in the exhibition, but. Uh, here's another one I was not able to snag for the exhibition, but working with the Historical Society's visual archives, I were able to nail down, you know, really these specific places of exactly where these things were. This one in the south end of Rockland. Um, it's remarkable to be able to do this, I think. Um, you know, not everybody has this archive and access to these things. So it really was uh, a privilege to be able to put these together and bring these forward. Uh, and it wasn't just Edward Hopper here. Andrew Wyeth's The Slip, painted in 1958 on the right. Uh, this depicts the Ava S. Cullison as it was pulled up. And you can see the photograph of it on the left there, um, kind of behind where Gamage is, is today. Maybe some of you remember it from when you were younger. It's been long gone before my time, but um, what else have we got here? The Sophie, or um, here it is in its heyday. 
you know, moving the granite stones, building Tilson's Wharf. By the time Wyeth encountered it, it had fallen on much rougher times, uh, but still a source of inspiration. Um, and here on the left, we've got a, a Jim Moore photograph of the Sophie as she lay where Andrew was painting her, and then this aerial photograph, which shows uh, the same location, but from a different perspective. This is Lehrman's Cove. Uh, Lehrman's Cove, kind of, this is that FMC plant or DuPont, whatever it is exactly now, I'm not sure. Now, Wyeth also responded to the lighthouse. I love this photograph on the left because it has the bicycle in it. And I'd like to imagine somebody riding their bicycle out to the lighthouse. <laughs> and if you could do that then, try it today. I know we have these new bikes with extra thick tires, but nah, I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah, and you can see the little keeper just on the end, kind of camouflaged in there. And the quarries, right? Um, you know, the following year, in 1927, the hoppers actually went out west and painted these western scenes. And so some of these quarry paintings in Rockland are easily confused. You might think this is the American Southwest and, you know, some beautiful piece of natural architecture when in fact this is a, you know, what's left of an industrial site after it's been stripped of its natural resources. Um, I've come to learn that these spires that are still standing there, this, these are composed of low quality limestone. So rather than dynamite them up and, uh, or smash them up by hand and process them, they would just be worked around. And so several of them are still visible, even if you go up, um, you know, look off Maverick Street, you can see them in the quarry up there. Um, Here's a painting I got to credit uh, my friend Kevin Beers, who's in the audience tonight, for bringing to my attention. This is um, a painting Hopper made called Civil War Camp. And it's actually about, I don't know, 50 paces from my front door. Um, I live on Talbot Avenue and um, have gone up there many times to you know, look and try and figure out exactly where he was standing when he, when he put this together. Um, but the Historical Society, you know, on the left has this photograph. This is uh, Camp Knox as it was in the 1860s. Um, you know, over a thousand men mustered up there to fight into, in the Civil War. Um, Hopper only painted three Civil War paintings and this is the only one that doesn't have any figures in it at all. Um, it's entirely possible that he would have become aware that the Civil War camp had been up there after meeting Civil War veterans here in the GAR. Um, you know, both Hopper and Wyeth were, um, you know, fans of American history, to say the least. And, you know, he may have read about it somewhere else, but I think it's more likely he would have just discovered it, um, you know, in his time around the town. So Hopper was here for, for seven weeks in his trip. And in those seven weeks, he made a, about 24 paintings. Um, his process was, you know, slow, well, compared to Wyeth, you know, it was, it was much slower, um, you know, more meticulous. Uh, you could compare that to, you know, Wyeth, who in 1937, 38, he was bragging about making eight watercolor paintings in a day. He would just be dashing them out. And he was the first to admit that you might take a dozen before you got one good one. But that was his process and you know hopper wrote to his dealer after arriving in rockland in, in early july that you know he'd made i think it was you know two paintings in 10 days and you know that was solid progress you know this, this was a creative burst actually it's a real surge in productivity um oh yes the atlantic house or the haunted house as it's called this piece in the middle um this is a Hopper painting that we're looking at in the center here. On the left-hand side is a photograph of the Atlantic House from the 1870s. And then on the right is a photograph of the same area I took uh, back in 2018. Uh, the Atlantic House was a, was a fun one to research about. 
this painting actually says Atlantic House on the back of it and was titled that initially by Hopper, but it was Josephine really who kept track of Hopper's work. She functioned as his registrar, his promoter, um, and she wrote in the, um, in the ledger book, Haunted House, and <laughs> gave it this official title. Um, so if you go digging through the history books, you'll see it with a few different titles, but you can see in her handwriting in the mark about um, July 1926, it's the haunted house. Um, your picture there on the right, where is the house now? What, what street is that? Five South Street. Yeah, South Street. <laughs> Ask anyone in Rockland, they'll tell you. Five South Street. <laughs> oh yeah, there you go. Um, so here's a couple of photographs from the Historical Society's um, archives and, and I guess a private archive on the top. Um, so looking at these, I was, you know, the one at the top really struck me with how similar this building is to the Olson House, which of course was a huge source of inspiration for Andrew Wyeth for decades. And then this one on the bottom where, let's see if I can run a little mouse. Yeah, okay. So the building that we're looking at, the Atlantic House is right here where the mouse is hovering. Um, and this gives you an idea of the industry that really was happening in Rockland. You can see the railroad, you can see the lumber that was there. Um, and that would have, I think, fed the um, shipbuilding that was happening right across the street. Right, yeah, so yeah, the house, the, the old boarding house, was, you know, you, it would board shipbuilders who would have worked and um, lived right there on site. Um, you know, this is another, you know, fun painting to have sat around the table and talked about here at the Historical Society with folks who remember going through there when they were younger and seeing, you know, things on the chalkboard on the walls and, you know, it was a, a different place. Um, but here to give that you know comparison. So on the left you've got Hopper's um, haunted house, and then on the right this is a a sketch that Andrew Wyeth made, or a study I should say, of the Olson house down in Cushing. Uh, this is a study he made for Christina's World. Um, it's just remarkably similar architecture, and it's probably true that you know before it was a boarding house, it may well have been a saltwater farm, just like the Olson house. And just to give you some context, there it is. And why it's masterpiece, Christina's World. Um, and why it's also inspired by Rockland's architecture here. You have this Italianate style house that belonged to Mr. Williams, who owned the Williams Quarry directly across the street, which you can see in this photograph. That building that's barely visible at the top of that quarry is his house, it's the same building. That's the subject of that painting. Uh, this gives you an idea of the scale of the quarries and what they were like here. Um, it was interesting for me to learn that the quarries, you know, what they're quarrying is limestone and the lime deposits are formed really by ancient shallow seabeds. I mean, it's basically seashells, just layers and layers of seashells. And at some point in our geologic history, that seabed was kicked up at a 90 degree angle. So in order to access and quarry this calcium, these calcium deposits, this limestone, you know, it's, it's relatively narrow because that's, you know, like the thickness of the seabed used to be, but it goes very, very deep because everything's been turned 90 degrees. Uh, at one point, these quarries were over 400 feet deep. I mean, that is incredible. You could have put the Statue of Liberty in there. The torch wouldn't even be near the surface. Um, and I think that they just kept going down, but I understand we've hit, you know, there was the technological limit. They couldn't pump out the water fast enough. Um, and of course, there were other places where the calcium or the limestone deposits were, you know, flat and much easier to harvest because they were just in these flat uh, seabeds that were easier, well, closer to the surface and easier to dig the lime out of. So, let's 
see, next. Ah, Hopper's Talbot House. Uh, a much closer to contemporary photo of the Talbot House from the Historical Society's archives. Uh, this was a fun piece to get into the exhibition because it was one of the ones that Suzette McAvoy couldn't get in 2004. Um, so we felt like between the two of us, we got pretty much every hopper that ever made it in Rockland back here. Uh, it's in a private collection, which has made it so difficult. Um, you can't just ask a museum. You have to ask someone to ask someone and pass this message forward. But we got it. And you can see it for another week or two. Um, here's the snow house in the, in the south end and a study that Andrew Wyeth made of it. Um, you know, really looking beneath Hopper's paintings, you can see that he carefully composed these things in pencil before he put his brush to them at all. And Wyeth didn't always do this, but he certainly could. And I'd like to, you know, through this drawing, try to dispel this myth that Wyeth, you know, didn't draw or couldn't draw, you know, really underneath here, he was a, a very casual painter with watercolor. But if you look at this drawing, he's really countered every clapboard, um, you know, drawing stairs like that is not an easy feat. This is really a carefully composed and carefully drawn, really almost like an architectural rendering. Um, and then kind of somewhat carelessly, you know, painted. Uh, here was a fun one. Um, this one I was really excited to work with because I'd already heard about this before we knew the exhibition could happen that Anne had discovered, Anne Morris, the Historical Society's curator, had discovered that this painting of Hopper's on the right, which was untitled, uh, had been given this title by curators in New York called Houses with Tombstones. It's an unfinished piece. Um, but it enables you that, that same kind of view in. If you look, you can see that he's drawn in pencil uh, he hasn't painted everything in yet, but he's drawn everything that he's going to paint well before he painted it. And this had been sort of lumped in with another series of drawings that were of graveyards uh, in Massachusetts. And to you know complicate things, Hopper went to Massachusetts after he was here in Maine, and he drew things down there. So they figured there was this was probably some view of that graveyard and. Um, you know, good enough. How could anybody from a New York office know any better back in the, you know, late 1960s anyway? But Anne discovered this building with its strange door on the second floor had, you know, nothing to do with a graveyard, but this was in fact um, a manufacturer of gravestones. This was a stone carving facility. And she nailed down these two photographs on the left, um, which document the building. Uh, where it stood until it was raised in 1966. Any idea why the painting was painted? You know, on this day, he was really hungry and it was lunchtime. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I couldn't possibly answer that. I'd love to. Um, you know, it might have started raining. Any number of things, um, you know, could have dissuaded him. And then, you know, the same with this one. You know, I. I perhaps should have used the word, you know, casually painted. Um, yeah, there's, there's really no way to know why they um, interrupted their progress on these things. And the one on Lindsay Street is across the street from the boarding house. Guy, who is giving this talk right now? <laughs> is it you or is it me? All right, I better get up to the next slide. <laughs> He's pushing me along. He's pushing me along. So is it enough for Anne to get, you know, here's a photograph of the building? No, I mean, she really nailed it down, digging through the city directories. So we find in the Sanborns directory that this is, let me read it off my computer. Yeah, the Rockland Marble and Granite Works, and it's located at 20 Lindsay Street. Great. So you can go there today and you can see that it is, in fact, not there. It's kind of across the street from Waterworks. There's an apartment building there now. Um, but what do we know about where Hopper stayed? You know, he wrote to his gallerist that he was staying in the home of Mrs. Acorn. So again, going through the Sanborns directory, Anne has nailed down, there are a few people named Acorn, and one of them is Mrs. Asenath, widow of Franklin B. Uh, Acorn, who 
had a home at 17 Lindsay Street. So this is probably painted from, you know, the front stoop, just looking across the street from the house that he was staying in. Uh, I better make Brian happy with this one. So this is, <laughs> this is uh, called Mrs. Acorn's Parlor. Uh, this would be the fancy parlor of the home, which um, still exists. I mean, maybe one of you is here. I don't know who owns that building, but it's a private residence here in Rockland, 17 Lindsay Street. Nobody. Okay. Um, you know, I, maybe that organ's still in there. That would be fun. The old pump organ. I was just at the trailing U on Monhegan, and they had a pump organ in the um, parlor. We were playing that. It was great. Uh, for fun, here's a photograph from the Historical Society's archives of the Farnsworth family's um, fancy parlor on the left-hand side, uh, juxtaposed with Mrs. Acorn's more, pot, more modest but still Victorian-styled uh, parlor on the right. And, you know, this Victorian stuff is all over. You can see the, the fancy woodwork, the um, patterns in the carpet, the kind of density in the carving of all of the furniture, this kind of plush environment with the padding and the seating. Um, has anybody, have, have all of you, I hope, gone to the Farnsworth and seen the homestead? No, it's pretty neat. That, that particular room, as far as I understand, has really largely been untouched and it's phenomenal how the colors have survived because the windows have been closed. Uh, another awesome discovery and brought forward was about Hopper's moving around the city, right? So he came by boat, not by car, like Wyeth, who was coming up from his places where he you know, lived in Port Clyde or in Cushing, he came up by car. Hopper had come up by train and then by boat. So when he landed in Rockland, he was on his feet. But at this point, Rockland had three railroads and one of them was this electric trolley system. You can see the picture on the top. This Trolley system ran, you know, through the center of a lot of the roads in town, ran right down the middle of Main Street. It actually connected Camden and Rockport. When it got into Rockland, there were spurs that went, you know, up to the Samoset, down to Owl's Head. Um, this particular car would serve the highlands and quarries, you know, take people up to work. Uh, it actually continued down into Thomaston and out to Waldeboro. Incredible thing that I wish we still had. Um, and then down below, you can see the heavier duty uh, Lime Rock Railroad. And this map on the left, this um, map I lifted from John Bird's book. If you hear John, good job. Thank you for letting me use your map ahead of time. Uh, I've plotted out some spots on it. The red spots, the, the one, um, let's see, out here by the ocean is where he arrived here at the, um, on the wharf. And then these long, these six long marks, those would be the beam trawlers that he encountered. And then these green spots are places that he painted. And as Ann picked up, you know, a lot of these are along this trolley route. So while he was in Rockland and he was hoofing it around, he may well have used this trolley system to get around. It's pretty neat. Uh, Wyeth also inspired by the trains. This is uh, his painting on the right. This is, uh, I think it's 1951 called The Brakeman, and on the left, a, a much earlier photograph of what I understand to be the circus arriving at town, and that's actually the crowd uh, there to greet the circus. Uh, one thing that really stands out about the, the body of work of both of these artists in Rockland is that there are very few figures, and the figures that are in there are hard to see, like this one hanging off the back of the rail car. When in fact, you know, in 1926, Rockland had 2,000 more people living in it than it has today. Uh, the density would have been much higher. Um, but for artistic purposes, they left figures out. Uh, and I'm going to leave you with, with this image. Um, you know, it was Rockland's Main Street in, in the 20s. And again, Kevin picked this one up, which is pretty awesome. This chop suey sign in the upper left corner. I, right, who doesn't love chop suey, right, <laughs> cheap food? I left this one here. This is the, the, the kind of departing idea in this catalog. It is a little bit of an Easter egg for any real art nerds because Edward Hopper painted a painting called chop suey, right? 
And in one of the uh, you know, public tragedies of recent American art history, this had been a promised gift to the Seattle Art Museum, but as the, the estate settled out, it was sold on the private market. It sold for over $98 million. And when you sell a painting like this, you write some heavy duty essays that go along with it to entice people to part with things like $98 million. And uh, among them is, you know, well, where is this? You know, where did he see the chop suey sign? I don't know, we gotta figure it out. Um, you know, he lived in New York his whole life. So probably it's, you know, this, chop suey place that had been in Columbus Circle in the Upper West Side of New York, but uh, a curator did mention, hey, Portland, Maine had one of these things in 1927 where Hopper did return and did paint down there, but geez, you know, Rockland had one too in 1926, I'm just saying. I don't think he painted it while he was here, but you know, you never know where ideas come from. Um, and so with that, I just want to say thank you. It was a lot of fun to be able to go through the Historical Society's archives and bring these things forward and have them kind of tell a third story. I feel like, you know, Hopper was able to have his expressions and Wyeth had his. And in some ways, um, you know, this communal voice of the Historical Society, a lot of different photographers, uh, a lot of different historians, and a lot of people who just wanted to share stories. Um, it was my privilege to bring those things together and share them out with the public this summer. So I hope you get a chance to see the show. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Oh, um, I, I have a question. Wow, that's loud. Um, the wharf that he landed, is that the one going down by the Coast Guard and Bix Bixby's, and is that that wharf? Yeah, uh, Tilson Avenue. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, just uh, a couple of minutes ago, you alluded to the fact that Rockland had several thousand more people when Hopper was here. Um, and it appears from the photographs that Rockland was enjoying great prosperity in 1926. Is that true? I, I think Rockland was riding the great prosperity it had um, achieved earlier than that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was right before the Great Depression, so things crashed pretty hard right after that. Yeah. Okay, and that leads into my second question. I'm confused about when Wyeth was here doing those paintings and had Rockland's economic condition fallen apart. Yeah, excellent question. So Andrew Wyeth painted in Rockland. The earliest painting I can find is actually of the Eastern Steamship Terminal in 1939. And he painted around, um, he painted the series around the Dragon Cement Plant um, in 2000, no, in 1998. So that's kind of where I think the other bookend is. Um, so yes, absolutely. Um, you know, the Rockland's, or the economic conditions in Rockland had, had drastically changed. Um, and also, I mean, there were these radical technological changes that were happening at the, the turn of the 20th century where we you know we were really shifting, um, you know, the marine shipping was changing from these wind driven wooden vessels to steam shield, steam hulled ships that were driven by coal and petroleum. And so these wooden schooners were, you know, often left to rot along the coast and they were, you know, fun for kids to play in and they were fodder for artists to, to paint on. Um, you know, Captain Swift up in Camden figured out he could start hauling people instead of cargo and, you know, kept the, the Windjammer cruises going. Um, but yes, um, I don't know, if, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, I'm just rambling now. Hey, my name is Frank Glover and it's really great to hear this presentation. Um, and some of the pictures, I'm surprised because I have everything to do with them. My great-grandfather was John I. Snow, the captain of the Sophie, 
and I had no idea um, yeah, that that was captured. Yeah, I mean, my father has great memories of that. I had thought that the Sophie was still very active through the 1930s. In fact, the Sanctity, a Nantucket steamer down in New Bedford, burned in New Bedford Harbor, and he took that down there to raise it and also took a mansion from Phippsburg up to Rockport, the Spite House. Yeah. So he made a lot of use of that. Uh, the Snow Mansion would have been his grandfather, Israel Larkin Snow. And my grandmother has great memories of its furnishings, which were similar to the Farnsworth House. It had the original gasoliers and ceiling medallions. Yeah. And then, um, the Talbot Avenue house, that's next to the W.H. Glover house, a great, great uncle of mine. So uh, I'm really delighted to have walked in on this. I often had wondered why he did not paint the W.H. Glover house, but that's my own prejudice. <laughs> I can't answer that. And I, a lot of people who visit there, you know, we wonder, you know, uh -huh. you've got this grander house next to it, and why not paint that one? It's a question we'll never know. Um, these are the as I understand it, you know, this red sided building, this is the Glover sheds, these lumber, oh, wow. lumber, Glover sheds lumber mill, yeah, on the um, waterfront. Just wonderful. My great grandfather, Fred Weston, got his degree in textile mill machinery at Bowdoin, and he left the company and moved to Charlotte, North Carolina in 1898 and founded a textile mill supply. And my mother's family, all Southerners, thought they were berserk. They thought they were just crazy Yankees. <laughs> but it they probably were. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so to your the stories about the Sophie, I think that it probably was fully working in the 30s. This painting that Andrew painted it when it was in uh, harder shape, that's from 1951. Oh, yes. So I think that, um, yeah, it had some solid decades after the after 1930. Yeah, thank you. So two things. Um, first, I'm wondering about this exhibition seems to be up for a really brief period. Mm. Is that because of the logistics of borrowing works or scheduling or? Yes, it has to do, uh, yeah, the logistics of, of borrowing works, then also light exposure. Um, these pieces, especially, um, well, yeah, I mean, all of these pieces are, um, I mean, they're they're national treasures, um, and we let's see. I don't want to get you know into too scientific in a, in a boring uh, lecture here, but basically, um, you know, light exposure is is cumulative. Um, you know, the colors fade. If you think about any, you know, if you've ever had a picture on your fridge, and you know, a year or so later, it's faded. And the same thing is happening to these paintings. Um, you know, we have friends in in light conservation that will measure. You know, just a little tiny square of blue in a Sargent painting, and then you exhibit it for three months, and then they measure it again as it comes down, and there is a change. So the reason we have these up for such a brief amount of time is we're hoping to save them for you know the next three, five, seven hundred years. People should be able to come here, and or see them wherever they are, um, and see you know as close to the true thing as they can. So it's preservation. And my other is just an observation. The um, Wyeth sketchbook that's in the show, mm. um, it's open to a schooner on the um, North End Railway. And that's the Merry Day, still sailing, still getting hauled out on that railway every year. Um, and it's clearly the Merry Day. Awesome. Built in 1962, and I think the sketchbook was from 1989. That's right, yeah. Did, uh, did Hopper um, sell anything uh, to local people while he was here in Rockland, or did he save everything for his new lo New York uh, dealer? People must have seen him working and, you know, may have offered him, uh, offered to buy something. That's a good question. <laughs> There's no record of him leaving anything here. Uh, I have heard a story about someone who found a Hopper in the attic, but it was so ragged that they just, you know, they're 
nephew or whoever threw it away and they just wonder, you know, could it, what could have been? That said, um, you know, Josephine did keep this journal wherein she wrote down um, the titles of the pieces, she documented their dimensions, the medium, and, you know, more important things or equally important things like where they were exhibited, who bought them, for how much. And um, it's pretty tightly documented and we can account for everything that's in there. So, you know, is it possible that something was traded for a lunch? I mean, maybe, but I think that the, really he wasn't very famous while he was here. And the people who he was famous with were not living in Rockland. So, um, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's kind of hard to uh, imagine, but again, you know, I, I say that, um, but then in, in the teens, Hopper was on um, Monhegan Island, and within the last, I date myself, I feel like, you know, within the last 10 years, there was a piece where a house on Monhegan sold, and there was a piece in the attic, and they said, oh, this is an Edward Hopper painting, and everyone went, yeah, sure. And then you bring it to these, you know, art forensics folks who tested it, and then they said, "Yeah, you know, this really is an Edward Hopper painting," and, and I think it sold for more than her house did. Um, <laughs> but that was to that was to a doctor, and you know, it was of his boat, and you know, more than likely, you know, he had some some event or something. You know, he needed some some help with from a physician, and then he was just you know able to trade that as a art student, really. Um, but if you if you hear of one in Rockland, you know I'd love to I'd love to know if you've got one. Or... Well, that particular style was fairly popular, wasn't it? In in 1926, I mean, wasn't it? Kind of. Uh... Um. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was growing in in popularity. He was, you know, one of many students of of Robert Henry, who was you know on an on an upswing. Um, you know, like George Bellows, um, Randall Davey, Rockwell Kent, you know, they were all students together. So yeah, I think, you know, his, his style and the crowd he ran with was popular for sure. Any other questions? Let me see if Zoom is any. I don't see any on Zoom. Any last minute questions before we wrap up? I'm Glenn Billington. My grandfather, Donald Carl, owned the Atlantic House at 5 South Street. And he had it torn down, uh, I believe, in 29, but I'm not real firm on that. We did, we did receive a few things from the Atlantic House. One is a half model, which I have over the door into the bathroom in my music room. And we did get a big wooden chest full of tools and I brought somebody down from Liberty Tool Works and uh, he bought them all I sold them all to him and there was one piece that was worth a could have been potentially worth a lot of money it was called a slick it was like a giant chisel and if we'd had the handle we didn't have the handle <laughs> but if we'd had the handle the the person would uh, tuck it into their shoulder and that's how they hewed the keel. And if I'd had that, that chisel alone would have been $1,000. But that kind of establishes that there were boat builders at the Atlantic House. Oh, definitely. Yeah. It was built by Francis Rhodes. And the boat that he was working on when he passed away uh, was called the Young Mechanic. And that's where Mechanic Street takes its name. His son was able to complete the boat. I love how much you all know about Rockland history. <laughs> Honestly, it makes my job so much easier when I can just talk Would to people. Grandfather should have brought the painting home? Well, yeah, I mean, you'd make $1,000 look like nothing if you had that painting. <laughs> um, didn't Hopper and Wyeth cross, cross paths at some point? Yeah, excellent question. I'm glad you asked. They they did know each other. Um, 
In fact, they were contemporaries. Um, you know, Hopper really was actually an entire generation older than Wyeth. He was born the same year as Andrew's father, N.C. But um, in 1942, as Andrew's own star was on the rise and Hopper was an established artist, Andrew asked him for a favor if he would come and help him jury an exhibition of watercolors that Andrew was putting together in Delaware. And Hopper agreed to do it as long as he could, you know, get down on the train, do this job, and get back all in one go. He didn't want to, you know, sit and dither about art all day long. But that really was the beginning of this friendship, and they maintained that. They exchanged Christmas cards. Um, you know, there's actually we're, we'll bring forward a, another more important exchange um, in an upcoming exhibition between Hopper and Wyeth about. Um, the power of abstract art and the path that the Whitney was taking in the 1950s. Um, but yes, they they did meet uh, face to face. They did correspond, um, and an equally, if not you know even more important connection happened um, at that same exhibition. Uh, actually, after the exhibition opened, there was you know the opening event and dinner and they're sitting down and Andrew's talking about sitting between he's like on cloud nine as a young artist sitting between his father who he idolizes and then Edward Hopper who he also is idolizing. Um, but at that same table you've got Josephine Hopper talking to Betsy Wyatt and Josephine's telling Betsy about how she's handling her husband's successful career and how she's making him draw a little cartoon of each composition and recording the dimensions, the medium, you know, where it was exhibited, when it was made, who sold it, and all those things. Betsy took those ideas and ran with them. She constructed the Wyeth Study Center, which exists here in Maine, and then there's also an equal amount down in Pennsylvania. Um, so yes, there is a major connection between the Hoppers and the Wyeths. Especially the wives. Especially the wives. <laughs> yeah. Back to the chop suey painting from Seattle. All right. Such an iconic, I'm familiar with it. I just, wow. So that was in Seattle and it was. No, 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 it, it was never in Seattle. It was promised to be gifted to the Seattle Art Museum after the owner died. Okay. Um, so it, it was in a private collection and is now back in a different private collection. Wow. Well, mm -hmm. um, it's probably painted in New York, to tell you the truth, mm -hmm. but the idea may have come from right here in Rockland. Yeah, I mean, Rockland, but I mean, when I think of the 20s, I think of that. That's such a great, <laughs> but it's private. Thank you. Yeah. But I wonder if that was a standard kind of sign, because if you look at that and the photograph, the U is squared. Mm, yeah, they are, yes. they are extremely Here similar. <laughs> um, it, you know, here's another story about the wives is um, both wives also functioned or served as models uh, for their husbands. Um, you know, the figure in Christina's world um, is, you know, really modeled after Christina, but it was Betsy Wyeth who got down in the grass and posed for him. Um, and these women, I would propose to you, are also all Josephine Hopper. Um, mm. Josephine modeled for all of Hopper's figures, so she would, you know, dress up or move around whatever position he needed. So even when there's multiple figures within a composition, it's her. Wow. All right. Any other questions? If that's it, then I think we'll wrap up for tonight. Thanks so much to everyone for joining us tonight, both in person and on Zoom. And thanks so much to Leith for uh, joining us tonight for giving such a wonderful talk. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank